to Ghoulish. I am Max Booth, a host. And today on the program, I am talking to a returning guest, a friend of the show. Oh, is that a fiend of the show? It's Tony McMillan. He has been on twice before, uh, last year. Obviously, uh, he couldn't have gone on before 2019 because the podcast did not exist. So Tony is back now because uh, folks who have listened to the previous episodes will know he uh, he is a cartoonist, a comic book cradle, and his uh, latest comic is called Silius Creatures, which is a book, a comic about a teenager trying to become a teenage... <laughs> nope, I fucked that up. He's a teenager trying to become a special effects artist growing up in the Hollywood movie industry of the 1970s, 80s, and 90s. It's kind of like Boogie Nights. If instead of uh, getting into pornography, it was uh, special effects stuff. And uh, well, anyway, he finished the season one of the comic books, and now he is a... Uh, Turning those six issues into a 200-page graphic novel. So if you missed the uh, issues as they came out, guess what? You can get the whole fucking book in one paperback. He is doing a Kickstarter right now. We uh, recorded this episode a few weeks ago. On the, the, the night before he launched the Kickstarter. So we uh, had no idea how it would do once uh, the, the next day came. But uh, it's been a few weeks since he launched it. And oh my god. His initial goal was only at 2500 He's almost at fucking $5,000 already. This this comic is taken off, and uh, I highly uh, suggest you uh, pledge to his Kickstarter and get yourself a copy of that paperback. My favorite comic book, maybe of all time, is really fucking good. And I hope you enjoyed today's episode with Tony. We're talking about Blue Cowl uh, Hill. So, like, you know, like, uh, think the movie, think of the movie Alien. How the kill tools we have will not your uh, typical science fiction cast, but instead we have, like, basically truckles in space. It's really cool. We're talking about the whole topic of Blue Cowl uh, employees in the Hill genre. So I hope you uh, enjoy the conversation, and I hope you pick up Ciliot's Creatures by Tony McMillan. And I hope you live spooky. I hope you die spooky. I hope you go to patreon.com slash pmmpublishing and support my dang Patreon, baby. I could use some Patreon bucks. Also, what I could use are some iTunes reviews. So go on over to uh, the ghoulish page on iTunes. Leave a spooky review. Also, if you want to tell me about some spooky things that have happened in your life and you want me to read those on a future episode of Ghoulish, go on over to ghoulishpod at gmail.com and let me know what happened. Maybe I'll read it on the pod. On the good old podcast. All right. I have talked enough. Let's just, let's listen to my conversation with Tony McMillan. <laughs> okay, Tony McMillan, welcome back hey. to Ghoulish. It's yes. been a long time since we uh, have talked. Mm. Uh, calling a Skype. The last time we had a conversation was September 2019. A whole year has passed. Holy crap, yeah. Anything uh, of been... a note has uh, happened since then? Anything? Oh, no. I mean, I, I, honestly, even in the news, it feels like a pretty dull year. I think we're all just kind of hanging out, you know, nothing nothing too eventful. I think in the uh, history books, they will call 2020 the mellow year. Yeah, 2020, the snooze. Like we have salad days. These are the uh, the sleepy days. I love. Actually, no, I would not. If twenty twenty is considered like the the chill time, that means twenty twenty one is going to be like alien invasion, fucking apocalypse. I don't know what else they could throw at us at this point. I'm ready. Are you ready for the alien invasion? What are you going to do? 
Um, I'm going to use the murder bees that everyone forgot about. Like, those murder bees are going to come in handy. Because that's like that's like uh, Chekhov's gun or whatever, right? Like, that's just bad writing if you don't use the murder bees for something. That's like in Science, that the kid had all, all this glasses of waddle going on. And then at the end, oh, you forgot <laughs> about those glasses? Bam, save the movie. Is that kid a Culkin? Was he, like, the eighth Culkin? He's one of the Culkins, I think. Maybe. Like- J.R.R. Culkin. <laughs> Have you read up about the Culkin clan? No. It's crazy, man. That the, the the dad was a piece of shit. He had like seven kids and they all lived in one room and he would basically just like shill them out to any place looking to cast any children at all. Like they had a kid of every age and gentle, so he would be like, What do you need, huh? A boy? <laughs> seven? I got him. <laughs> wow, a little emporium of children. That's uh, that is a piece of shit. Wow. Yeah, nobody talks to him now. I know a lot about the Colkin family. I don't know why. But... <laughs> are 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 you actually the father? <laughs> uh, well, my oldest son was named uh, <laughs> uh, Chad Colkin. So <laughs> right. <laughs> Wouldn't that be a twist? A terrible twist. It... What's funny is like I, I think only one of them is really a decent actor. I mean, Macaulay's got charisma in his own weird way, but it's not like a good actor. He's fine. I like uh, the one in Secession though. He's great. Oh my god! It's an- Wait, is that the same one who was in uh, Science? Uh, what do you call it? Uh, 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 Scott Pilgrim vs. the World. I don't know, man. They all look the same. <laughs> <laughs> it's very true. Maybe there's just one kid. He he just kind of. <laughs> They're actors, right? They can figure shit out. That would be the biggest scheme. The biggest con job of history, if we discover there's only one Culkin brother. <laughs> oh, I'm into it, man. I mean, the way you described their upbringing, it sounds like the Wolfpack documentary, but those poor kids whose dad kept them indoors for like their entire life and they got way into movies. But the, I guess the only difference is these kids were in movies, like actual I movies. I don't know about this documentary. Oh, you, it'll, it'll knock your socks off. It, these, um, I don't know, five brothers whose dad was a kind of a like agoraphobic and a psycho and he kept them indoors and they to pass the time they made uh, home movies so the documentary uh, they would reenact like uh the dark knight or reservoir dogs or whatever they watched and they did it with a cardboard like um uh, batman armor and made out of cereal boxes and shit it's amazing it's on netflix called the wolf pack it's um okay it's uh it's, it's really good i'm gonna have to check that out that sounds fun that sounds like something yeah. i would have done except uh, not as creative <laughs> it's just been sad and indoors yeah that's, were you that's a, uh, yeah. were you a creative young boy tony <laughs> <laughs> wow uh that's a good line read uh yeah i definitely was i was um one of my things i was kind of known for in, in my neighborhood was um walking around and talking to myself and i was <laughs> enacting yeah and I, I was basically in uh enacting movies that i was making up in my head and um, I often had, like, older people, I, I come home, my mom's like, yeah, this guy is asked if you were okay. He saw you from a distance and just, like, was wondering if uh, you were all right. And I said, yeah, it's just Tony making his movies. And I'm like, okay, cool. Thanks, Ma. <laughs> yeah, that's the kid who uh, walks around talking to himself. Uh, keep your distance. Uh, oh, shit. Uh, social distance. Oh, my God. That's pretty relevant now, isn't it? <laughs> were you a creative kid? I guess so. I uh, yeah, I used to make comic books, Tony. I would. Uh, oh, make, that's right. You used yeah. to sell them to people on the bus. Yeah, like crack, but not that. Not even close to that. And so so crack, imagine crack, crack cocaine, but instead of crack, it was just a comic book. <laughs> I've uh, I've never smoked crack, but uh, I have smelt it, and it really smells bad. And so comics smell great. So. I think you have that up on crack. What does it smell like? It's hard to... It, it, to my, my, my memory is it smells a little chemically, like almost like bleachy, but then it just, it just stinks. It's like 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 old tr- like hot trash or, or BO or something. Hot I, trash? I, I don't know. I swear in my part... That's yeah, what I was saying. It's a cold trash. Cold trash is... Ooh, that's a good name. Yeah, I just remember my old apartment complex. Uh, we we smell something, and eventually somebody was like, "Oh, that's the smell of crack." I'm like, "Oh, it's awful." God, why are you putting that into your old body? I mean, there has to be drugs that smell delicious, like meth. I don't. Know. I I, yeah. <laughs> I assume crack uh, must feel awesome, and that's why people do it. I mean, it must yeah. be. I mean, it's awesome, super addictive. But like, yeah, I I guess uh, it equals out the smell, man. 
The pill to me suspects meth smells really good because it kind of reminds me of candy being that type of glass. Like called rock candy. <laughs> well, well, it's funny. Okay, as a kid, I uh, I had tried meth like a couple times. It sounds weird. I dabbled in meth. As I snorted it. I don't remember. I uh, this I honestly was very young. I was like thirteen or fourteen. No, I was fourteen. But anyways, um, I, I don't remember anything. And the thing was, I was all I already smoked some weed and I was drinking, so I don't remember what it even did to me. So um, I, I I basically I just dabbled in meth and lived to tell. As a child, it's, you little extreme. It, oh, I, it's funny. I've gotten nothing. I've become more and more boring as I've gotten older. I like I started out drinking Everclear and I tried meth a few times, but now I'm like I'll have two tall boy beers tops at night and then go to bed promptly. That's it. That's uh, still extreme. I think a tall boy. That's like a boy who isn't a boy. <laughs> That's what they should call those beers. This is the boy who isn't a boy. Hey, you want to come drink some boys with me? I don't know. This boy's tall. Oh, actually, it's a good call. Like, if you had a regular beer, it's called. This is called a regular boy. <laughs> like, nah, that doesn't. Mm-hmm. Then if you had like one of those mini cans, hey, you want to come uh, chill a small boy with me? Ooh, I can, I, I can, I can knock down a few small boys. <laughs> I would chug a small boy. Let me tell you. Uh, so why are we talking today? What are we? Uh, what are we promoting? You have a, a Kickstarter going on for a comic book. Tell us about this. Yeah, um, so I have finished uh, creating six issues of Serious Creatures, my uh, comic book series about a teenage special effects artist who's uh, growing up in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And now I'm using Kickstarter to uh, uh, sell the new collection, which collects all six issues as well as a bunch of behind-the-scenes stuff. And Kickstarter is going to run through uh, September 8th and then 30 days after that, whatever that is. And basically uh, we're trying to get the word out and – uh, all the money that goes to uh, that doesn't go to making the comic books and shipping the comics will go to making extra copies to to send to more shops and 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 uh, reviewers and stuff like that. How have uh, how has comic book shops been uh, dealing with all this shit going on? I haven't been in one in a long time. Yeah, it's funny. I, I've been really trying to support my local shop here in uh, in Boston, which is called Kamikaze. But um, it's been tough because the biggest thing is obviously a lot, a lot of places had to close. But beyond that. Um, comics have this really bad deal where there's a one distribution company which distributes all comics. It's called Diamond, and Diamond just stopped right when the pandemic really hit. They just said we're not gonna we're not gonna do anything. We're not gonna ship comics. We're not gonna do anything. And this cut off. So basically, uh, even the shops who could um, who could pivot from uh, having people come to the shop, they will deliver your comics to you or mail them to you. Well, there are no new comics being created. And so that they they see like my shop will sell you know they're doing a lot of discounts on old comics and you can back up your collection and get some cool new old stuff, and basically the whole industry is at a, at a standstill. And then uh, on top of that, DC Comics, which is you know the number two uh, uh, name in town, Batman, and Superman, they had a big, uh, a huge they call it like a bloodletting where they, they fired a bunch of people and it's kind of up in upheaval what they're going to do with their comic line. And so it's been it's been a kind of dicey time for the comics industry. So um, in general, I think comics are they're, they're coming back, and the industry's still around, but it's 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 a little shaky right now. I also I, I think I saw something before uh, DC uh, let go of everybody. They had decided to cut ties with Diamond altogether. Is that correct? Like yeah, it is correct. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's 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 like people just don't know what to think of it. And like the good, one of the good things is like you know Diamond was a monopoly, so it, it, that's never a good thing. But if you didn't have any backup plan, then it's 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 not like there's somebody who can like it's not like there's four companies who are like oh we're ready to you know pick up the slack. And so everyone's kind of scrambling to figure out what they're doing. And this is all you know I'm just a, a guy who reads stuff and I talk to some shop owners, but so I could be getting a few of these facts wrong. But it, it is definitely, the comic industry has had a lot of ups and downs, and this is not the first, and it won't be the last, and the comics aren't going to go anywhere, I don't think. But um, it's it's a weird time, man. Yeah, it's a strange time full of many things. Not me, I'm I'm doing great, and not, no complaints. How about you? Dude, I've heard you're doing great, man. I uh, Are you, <laughs> do you 
Can you talk about the the, the job on, on air? Are you like... Yeah, why not? I uh, yeah, I uh, quit my job. And that's why it's another reason why uh, we're talking today on this podcast because uh, right. the theme of this episode is uh, what was the fuck was it? A uh, blue collar. So uh, spooky people who have day jobs. <laughs> yeah, man, exactly. Would you consider like Freddy Krueger like? Like clocking in, is that a job going into these dreams? No, he's actually working a dream job. You know, <laughs> shut the fuck up. You know that was good, right? <laughs> it like, was that pretty, was like it was you're good. just like fuck, man. That's pretty shit. Yeah. Um. So I think for him, it's it's definitely a passion project. I I actually feel like uh you can see like the the the. Uh, the 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 segue from Jason starting out as a real he's really into it. It's like a teacher. He's like, oh, I'm gonna change these kids' lives. You know, I'm gonna make a difference. And then by part six, he's just like, here we are. I'm just trying to wait for my tenure. You know, it's fucking just treading water. And it, and sometimes literally in part six. But um, I, so I think it depends on the on the franchise and the monster. Yeah, uh, I wasn't planning on uh, doing much self promotion on my own since we're promoting this comic book of yours, but I, it just clicked with me that I would be a fool not to mention it. But uh, next week, uh, through my company, we are releasing a novella from a guy named Paul Michael Anderson called Standalone, and it's basically exactly this theme. It's about these these folks who uh, they have this day job, they go to this this odd like a uh, like lobby room and they get they get assignments and like they go into these uh, magical uh, doorways and they get sent to random places and different uh realities and with assignments of killing everybody in like this location <laughs> so but also they have these costumes on like these uh like these uh, astronaut costumes that make them look like different uh like slash olds to the people who see them so it's mm. kind it's kind of like a, a cabin in the woods meets uh, right. monsters inc in a strange way <laughs> that's that's awesome that yeah. sounds great it's super awesome. i mean it, it really does uh, meet the whole blue collar aspect because it's just ah fuck it's time for my uh, my shift to begin right um, and it, that's that sounds great man like uh, um what's it called again standalone Standalone, yeah, that sounds great. Um, it says next week. I, I, that sounds like right up my alley. I, I think uh, there's there's something that they said about horror and uh, the drudgery of work, whether it be blue collar or office. It, it does lend itself to that. I mean, horror kind of can be anything. It's really uh, malleable. Um, but I, I, I really like that kind of stuff. And Monsters Inc. Especially, I, I love the idea of uh, monsters or. Just, evil spirits, whatever, having some sort of organization and unions and different like red <laughs> tape and bureaucracy. I think this is such a funny, but it seems sort of right. Yeah, definitely. I love that movie. I do too. Although I think it's total rip off of uh, little monsters of Fred Savage. That's oh, like the, OG. yes, yes. You were completely right. What the fuck? That yeah. Is a and rip off. I, and I, I, I love them both. But when I first came out, I was like, wait, isn't this the same deal? Like, Oh my god, I've never connected that until you said that, but holy crap. That movie <laughs> skilled the shit out of me because that dude, Howie Mandel, looks uh, terrifying. <laughs> I was more scared of a uh, boy, the the evil ruler who has like a little, like, in the back of his head, it's all like H.P. Lovecraft and stuff, and then his face melts off, and he's got, a, a, like, underneath his human face, there's like a real evil little face. Nobody talks about that movie anymore. What 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 gives? Will's Criterion. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, seriously. I would. I think it I honestly deserves it. It has the great talking head song at the end. Uh, they piss in a kid's fucking. What is Howie Mandel pissing? The kids like lemonade or something. Oh, yeah. Drinks piss. Like, it's pretty rough. I mean, <laughs> it's nice. I love uh, anyone who drinks piss in a movie. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's always a good Absolutely. gag. Waterworld's great, man. I and mean, he drinks his pee and he cleans. I mean. Uh, Kevin Costner is a visionary. Do you know how much pee is drank in Jobs? A lot. Um, oh, okay. I did not know that. I mean, come on. All those kids in the ocean? They're drinking someone's pee. Oh, good call. That's why the shark's killing them. That makes a lot yeah, of sense smell now. like piss. Fuck yeah, little that, pee hot dogs, little babies. Ugh. That shark's addicted to piss. I'm learning I, a lot. I think my favorite example of, like... Uh, like, like, the best. <laughs> I'll show you that video after we uh, finish this podcast. My, uh, my favorite example of like this type of genre of just like people having 
nine to five regular day jobs and then shit happening is alien because the yeah. whole like space truckle thing is so cool i mean what do you think about that so I think what's really interesting is so Dan O'Bannon writes the screenplay for Alien. Dan O'Bannon also directs uh, and writes Return of the Living Dead, and he's also the ex writing partner of John Carpenter. And John Carpenter does The Thing, and before that, John Carpenter him did Dark Star, which is basically the the kind of the first like, space truckers kind of working stiffs in space, and then Alien. So basically, I think Dan O'Bannon's like is like the heart of all this kind of. Uh, great horror or sci-fi uh blue collar stuff like i think he's sort of like the the grandfather godfather of it all and aliens like the first time I, it really hit me because like what's cool about alien is that you have to see the whole hierarchy there's the stiffs who are you know um friggin cancer cowboy guy uh harry uh what's his name Dean from- Santon, yeah yeah, yeah, exactly. So you got those dudes, you got the scientist types, you have like Ripley higher up, and you see, you know, those guys are worried about the bonuses and stuff, and everyone else is like trying to, you know, you see how it would work. Like, it seemed really realistic. Like, you're out in space, it's still the same thing. You're still like these guys who, who tell you what to do, and then the company doesn't give a shit about you, and you're just trying to get back home. And I, I thought that was really perfect. And I, I loved, and now watching Alien, one of my favorite parts of it is simply that. They, everyone's smoking and everyone's wearing Hawaiian shirts and trucker caps <laughs> yeah. and it doesn't and it's not drawing attention to itself it's just like it's like of course what I mean what do you want us to wear like weird like shiny no we're just we're, we're working dude I can imagine like some high up going like we have a dress code and them going like yeah talk to the union pal yeah, well yeah I actually always wondered if it's like sort of like when they, when they started out on the alien ship like they, uh, Nostromo, they, they all look a little more clean cut and whatnot, but then by like month four or whatever they're at, they're like, fuck this, I'm growing stubble, I'm smoking more, I'm wearing a Hawaiian shirt, like, you know, they're putting up their porn posters in their locker room or whatever, I, I, because I, it's like, and that's why I also think of the thing, and the thing, all these guys are out in this isolated little Antarctic uh, station, like, they, they probably didn't all start out with beards and, and being so kind of strung out looking. They, they probably just kind of devolved into that eventually. Yeah, it's a, it's a big case of what are you going to do about it? Let us go. We're in space. <laughs> right. Like, yes, that's a great. I mean, that's how I feel with my job now, basically. That's how I felt with those uh, last two weeks of my job. Once I put my two weeks in, I was like, what are you guys going to do to me? Come on. <laughs> my, my, my favorite thing I, I used to work at a medical warehouse and um it was super bowl it was a saturday before the super bowl and i don't care about football but it, this comes into the story so basically i got into a car accident uh, some guy t-boned me i got really hurt i worked actually at a hospital and so i was at the emergency room there and i wasn't i was banged up and they gave me an excuse to not go to work the next day and um i i didn't so i called the boss and i left a message i was like hey I, i'm going back in the er i'm hurt i can't work you know i'm sorry so the boss didn't believe me. He thought that it was Super Bowl, and so I was going to party, and so I just, you know, blew him off. So he fired me. Well, so a couple of days later, I come in to get my last check, and I have my stuff in the emergency room, and he realizes that he can't just fire me. And so he's like, you know, uh, you still want your job? I'm like, yeah. And so for about a year until that guy uh, moved on, he quit. He wouldn't say shit to me because he was. We're basically like, what could he? What could he do? He basically <laughs> he had fired me and hired me back, and he knew I kind of had some shit on him, some leverage, and so it was a great year. I fucked around nonstop. That's that was, the best type of job, man. Being able just to fuck around. Yeah, yeah, most, most definitely, and and like that's one of the things. Like, um, to, to talk about horror and, and work, blue collar stuff, like. Uh, Daniel Ban, the guy who wrote Alien, he also uh, wrote and directed Return of the Living Dead, and that's probably my favorite zombie film, and it's one of my favorite uh, just fun movies in general. Like, it's, I think it's a good party film. You put it on, just have a good time. So oh. uh, the thing with that movie is I have never seen it in my life. Holy shit. I, I, try, I tried to see it before we did this episode. I looked down a there's a website called uh, justwatch.com, and if you type a name of a movie in, it says uh, what place it might be streaming, right? So I right. did that, and it said it was on uh, shuttle.com. So I said, fuck yeah, I can watch this real fast. Right. And the website lied. It's not available. <laughs> um, you know, obviously, I, I grew up loving this film, but I think if you're into horror, and especially 80s stuff in general, you're going to dig this film. It's... um. It's the origin of of uh, zombies saying brains in, in movies. It's the first time that was ha- that happened. They're they're fast zombies. Uh, Dave Keaton, a uh, mutual friend of ours, loves this film. And what's 
uh, all, all you need to know really about it as far as it applies to this conversation is that it's basically about a guy's, uh, a kid, like a, a maybe 18-year-old kid, his first day on the job at a medical warehouse. Uh, and, uh, of course, he un he unleashes a zombie apocalypse. But it's the, the whole time while it's, it's happening, his his uh, supervisor is like, you know, like, bite your lip if you like this job, boy. And he's like, like this job? But he's like, he's not quitting because he's like, I need a fucking job, man. Yeah. And that's kind of the heart of this to me is like essentially like no matter how horrible life can be if even if people are getting murdered around you unless you know you win the lottery you're gonna have to work and you and, and i love um like sh even like shows where like um like buffy or whatever when like they're fighting monsters all the time but they still have to you know pay rent and it's like yeah that feels like it's like spider-man like yeah no matter what man you got the there's certain things you can't escape yeah so often especially in this genre uh, like riddles tend to ignore the fact that jobs exist and we have to all do them. Like uh, a good example of it done right is a novel uh, called John Dies at the End by David Wong. Yeah. Have you read that? Yeah. Like yeah, there's yeah. a scene in it, I believe. It's been a while, but like <laughs> they just finished like killing a bunch of, I don't know, dick demons probably. And then uh, he <laughs> goes and someone's like, hey, where are you going? And he's like, I have a shift that begins in like 20 minutes. <laughs> right. Yeah. I have to go to the video store. What do you mean? I can't just quit because I'm fighting supernatural monsters. I have to pay rent. Yeah. And I, I really appreciate that because like um, a, a lot of films, I mean, I can suspend this belief, but a lot of times I'm like, after some, you know, someone, they're, they're, even if it's not monsters or, or horror stuff, I, I, I kind of like, if they're going to do something all night long, like, like what do you how do you get ready for work the next day do you have the day off like what, what how do you make ends meet how does that work and with um especially there's a sort of like a i think there's a big movement now for uh, to be a lot of teenagers like doing everything you know like riverdale or whatever they're like, teenagers are fighting crime they're stopping serial killers they're doing this and that and i get that you're you're a teenager maybe you don't have to work but you still have school and of course i i just kind of like eventually it stretches my disbelief a little too far and i i can't help but go like like, doesn't this impact the bottom line? Like, what if you get fired? Like, what? And that's one of the things I, I always liked about early Stephen King is that he comes from a very blue collar background. And so people work at laundromats, people are construction workers, people are miners. And I do understand as he got older and he made more money, he probably related a little bit more to like people who, um, who had, who had more income and more leisurely time. So a lot more of his, prota his protagonists become like writers or people with a little more money or, or people who it's like, it's a lot, it's, it's basically, it's a lot easier to write a rich character because you can basically go, Oh, they're going to take a, a couple months off and go to some uh, remote place. And, 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 you know, like uh, then they're getting, the, they're getting, they're going to discover some occult thing because they have like, you know, a couple months to, to get away from work or it, it they also have money to kind of like Mr. Burns it. And if you need to buy something to make the story move forward, you can do that. But if you have somebody who has like a shift, they have to, it's another little obstacle. It's another little, little hurdle. I, I, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I think it also makes full fun uh, set pieces too. Like if Schultz still a uh, night shift with the, the guy, he's like a stillaminate, right? And then he has to go and fucking kill these goddamn rats in the <laughs> basement. Right, yeah, I, I I remember I actually have never read the um, uh, short story or the novella it is, but I've, I've seen the film, and uh, one of my favorite Stephen King's uh, working blue collar things is actually Maximum Overdrive. I yes. think that uh, I, I well, the first thing is like that's the first time I saw on film that whole thing about how if you are on probation, you know, a lot a lot of places will hire you and garnish your wages and basically treat you like a kind of almost a slave and if you get out of line you'll you know they'll tell your probation officer and throw you back you know in in prison and so i was like oh that's pretty rough and I, you know later movies i've seen it too but it's the first time i saw that and so there's like that that scary le level and then you also just have like i love like what's cool about blue collar stuff too is like you have a lot of different types of people who are working together it seems like maybe i work i work in an office now and there are different types of people but i feel like it's it's a little more um, homogenous now. Whereas blue collar people, like when I worked as a dishwasher, people from all kinds of parts of the world and different like uh, levels of society, like different uh, financial situations, and and it's really interesting. And especially if you have a horror situation where you're stuck in one location, you, you have like a bunch of guys who are who might not get along, but they all work together, and that's there's a lot of. Uh, uh, potential for clashes there. I think that's really fun. Yeah, I think 
I guess the difference between like office milk and milk like hands on stuff is like and you have a lot of, maybe you have you have a lot of downtime in an office usually, right? But like I used to yeah. do a lot of like overnight stocking jobs, like at grocery stores and stuff. Right. And we would all come in basically united with one goal of getting everything done by the time we clock out. Like if, if someone finished like an aisle, they would just go over to the next guy who needed help, who was slacking and they would help him. And it's this right. common goal that we kind of bond over. And we, it's like, we all have an enemy in front of us that we can see. And we just have to team up and get this <laughs> shit done. But like with an office, yeah. work, it's more like there's no end in sight. Maybe. No, I think it's totally true. Like, I think that there's a bit of a, almost like a combat sort of mentality to like a lot of like, when I, when I worked at uh, medical warehouses, basically exactly the same thing. We have these orders to fill. We got to load up these trucks. Um, if you get your part done and help me off mine and we got to get out of here. And, you know, we had mandatory overtime. So basically that means if the trucks are late or whatever, you have to stay, you'll get paid, which is awesome, but you can't just walk out. It's a hospital. You gotta, you gotta stock it. And so there was definitely like, we're in this together. And, you know, I was also for a period, the, the night guy. So I um, had help for a little bit and then it was just me by myself at night, but uh, I still had that kind of thing where I'm setting it up for the morning crew. And the office is kind of funny. Like, you know, I've seen office space as a kid and my, my biggest takeaway was like, you know, besides, uh, I like that that next door neighbor guy from uh, Beverly Hillbillies was um, <laughs> wants to do two two chicks at once. That was hey, amazing. Go to Channel Nine, <laughs> <laughs> Peter, because uh, he looked just like my fucking uh, mom's boyfriend actually. Except my mom's boyfriend is Mexican, but basically same mullet. Everything else is the same. But anyways, um, the biggest takeaway besides that was that um, these office guys are complaining about how bored they are. That must be nice. It must be really really nice. And now that I work in an office job, it is. It actually is really nice. I don't. I, you know, I, I figure somebody like you or me who has things they do on the side, like creative things, it's it's perfect. If people don't have anything in their life, I guess it sucks, but that's because their life sucks already. Um, so I have tons of time to do my little side projects or even just dream up stuff, you know, which is great. But uh, it's just, it's weird. There's like the, the malaise of the office and, and, and they do this in like the Belco experiment in some newer horror films where the, it's the malaise of like, uh, nothing really matters. You're just a cog in a machine. And you know, there, there's something to be said about that, but I think it's a lot more compelling to be like, not only does nothing matter if you don't get your job, if you don't do what you're supposed to do and bust your ass, you're going to be fired and then you're going to lose your apartment and then you're on the street. I think that's a little more, um, that kind of gets me a little more uh, into it. I don't know. Yeah, that consequence doesn't seem as like tangible often in movies as it should be, and then when it is present, it's it's great. Yeah, I, I think so. And like, uh, there's there's. Do you ever watch the show I Zombie? No. You heard of that? I know what it okay. is, but I haven't seen it. Okay, so it's based on a comic book, and here's the the one. I only watched the first season, and it was it was fine. It was cool, but I wasn't like I had to watch it. But the comic book. And she's a zombie, but she's intelligent. She can talk. But the thing is, in the comic book, her job is she's a grave digger, which is you know funny. But it's also it's you know she works at she you know it's it's pretty hardcore. She has to, you have to dig a ditch every day and uh, a couple ditches. And then in, in the show, they made her uh, a forensics like person, which I guess it makes sense. Like, but they're making it like you know it's a procedural. But I'm also like. Uh, what I really liked about in, in the comic was like, you know, she's busting her ass. It's also kind of cool. It's a woman who's doing a very physical job and, and she's surrounded by guys. And it's not like, you know, it's overtly like, oh, she's like, you know, the only woman doing this. It's it's, it's like an, an outsider in, that, in an outsider in an outsider. It's like a Russian doll of outsiderisms. And uh, she, basically, you know, she's blue collar guys after they're done, they're going to get a couple of beers, maybe go bowling. And then she's also going to fight other monsters and stuff. And that, that was cool to me. That was like. It was like it was like a blue collar Buffy. It, it was like that was that was sweet. And then the show, it didn't have that element. And and you know obviously I think everyone likes to be represented on uh, in media. So I'm biased, but I do. Um, I usually kind of I I more easily identify with uh, blue collar people in in stuff. I also think it's satisfying to watch someone do a job and do it well, like to see the mechanics of it and. With a job that's just like office bill, well, just looking into a microscope, it's it's billowing. It's not exciting. That's that's so true. Because yeah, I, I I've actually uh, on Dave Keaton's uh, podcast, him and uh, J. David Osborne, uh, they they it's almost good. It's a it's a pretty cool podcast. But uh, they talk a lot about how they love watching in movies or shows 
somebody who's really capable, like do process stuff. Like, oh, if you're a mechanic, how do you uh, take apart an engine or whatever? Or, if, or it, it, you're right. If you're, it's like uh, in the '90s when they try to make hacking really compelling in movies, and it's like it's not quite. Cool. I don't care how many camera cuts you do or sound things. It's somebody type into a keyboard, and then a little screen comes <laughs> up, and then another box, and then it's like we're in. And it's like it's never going to be cool. It's, Enhance. Right, exactly. It's like it's like watching me do Photoshop. It's like uh, okay, oh, that's a good font. It's like who gives a fuck? I mean, I, I think it's yeah, the it, same as like a like. It's why I get so excited when they do a bank heist in the movie. It's the same thing. They cut. They have a job and they're doing it. They're following it through and they're moving. They're being physical. They're seeing someone move instead of just talking while in front of a computer. Yeah, and I think one thing too. Um, I, I know. I guess no one has said this overtly to me, but I think they've said things which kind of led me to believe this. But anyways, uh, since I, I I worked a lot of blue collar jobs and now I work in an office job, uh, people sort of sort of imply to me that you know, well, you know, now you're using your head, and it's like, uh, no, actually, before I had plenty of things I had to think through. I just also had to physically do things to accomplish goals. So it's actually a lot harder. I'm, I'm, I'm using my head and, and my body. It's like, it's it, this job we work in an office is actually a lot more just cerebral, but this, the other job enco encompassed that as well. So I, I think with, um, I guess, I don't know. I, I think people haven't ever, it's funny. To me, I think I always kind of assumed that everyone as a teenager really worked at a, like a McDonald's or did something a little bit, but that's not exactly the case. And, and, you know, all those jobs, you know, even people say like anyone can do these jobs. Not, no, I mean, all these jobs take a lot of thought and effort. Even if you're just following orders or whatever, you have to memorize stuff. You have to think through things. You have to problem solve. And I'm talking about, you know, working any job you can imagine that you think might be like, oh, a teenage kid does it. Yeah, he does. But like, it's tough. Maybe that's why teenagers suck a lot of times at jobs. That they yeah. are tough. Yeah, I mean, I'm thinking of the, the grocery jobs I used to do and how much mental math I had to do within split seconds, basically playing Tetris Tetris all day, trying to figure out how to make things not collapse on to casting goals. <laughs> oh, the, one of my worst feelings, and I do it all the time because I'm not going to stop. I'm a bad person. But when I go to the, the grocery guy, he's putting the milks and he's ordering it. And I'm like, I have to grab the gallon. I'm so sorry. i got to ruin your whole fucking thing here, dude. But And they never say anything to me, but I'm like, I know you hate me. Yeah, I get they it. do. <laughs> the last thing we would all have to do before clacking out was called a zoning. That's basically going down every aisle and pulling things to the front and making it look neat. And every fucking time, just as I would finish, I would end up finishing. Someone would come up and grab a can, and I would go, "God damn it!" That was me every time. <laughs> I, have, I have a whole bunch of disguises, but that was me. So now, like, and I didn't even want the. It's built into my system. Like if I'm walking into a grocery store and I see something pushed back, I just automatically zone you face it. it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> uh, it was funny too. Like um, speaking of grocery stories, is like um, I thought the mist. You know, I actually loved the short story that Stephen King did, and um, I thought the film was uh, it was pretty good. But I, I just love the location of a supermarket, and I love. Um, I always thought at the end of Army of Darkness when it has that scene at the S Mart. I really wanted part four to just be S smart. Fuck. S smart. Right? I have that as a note on the thing I, I wrote for this episode, how <laughs> it's disappointing. None of those movies ever took place in a goddamn grocery store. Yeah. Cause the grocery store is a microcosm society. It's another, it's another thing where everyone kind of goes there and you can have a bunch of different people. You have politicians, you have cops, you have fucking everyone just, they have to buy milk or whatever. Everybody needs groceries. Everyone needs a fucking can at the end of the night. But, um, I, I thought that like um, I, I you know in, in the mist they have of course the crazy religious lady and you have all these different people and but I remember, I remember like in the movie the 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 bag boy who gets like killed by tentacles and like his boss is kind of like uh, ordering him to go out and like do stuff and I just love when like uh, people who are just working a job they still kind of listen to their boss even though like the situations kind of escalated into like beyond work like there are terrorists or there are monsters or whatever and it's like still like i'm gonna listen to this guy because he has a mustache and he's been telling me how to you know move orange juice for the last year or so he probably knows yeah it becomes like ingrained into how you behave like well he always tells me what to do so he should he should know what to do now and in reality the little guy is like i don't know what i'm doing oh of course not yeah and like you know i i've had like in jobs i've been like a manager and and i've been you know not the manager and it's it's funny how 
you, you can be a manager and not have any idea what you're doing really, or sometimes you you do know, but it's 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 a really weird it's a really weird thing. I think that having jobs in general is a weird thing that humans have created because we have to, but. I don't think it's natural in a lot of ways. I think working together is, and, but when you kind of break it down to like, I'm going to go to this thing that I don't care about, but I need money. It just, it becomes more and more, it's a really weird social construct. But I, I mean, obviously I don't live in fucking uh, Star Trek. I have to do it. Yeah. I think about that a lot. Like I think about how, man, I need this vehicle so I can get to my job and I need this job so I can pay <laughs> off this vehicle. It doesn't make any fucking sense. No, it, exactly. It's it, it. That's one of those things. It's. And it, I, I'll say this too. I was thinking about this a lot. Um, for the show, as a kid, okay, like I I I, I relate to all these blue collar um uh, scary films and like uh, Return of the Living Dead, for instance. The kid was a younger guy who was the first day working in a medical warehouse. I eventually worked in a medical warehouse. Uh, I have fought zombies. We had a lot in common. But the thing I really relate to was um. It, it, it's changed as I got older. As a kid, I was like, you know, I'm going to work these blue collar jobs, but secretly, you know, I'm actually the super talented artist guy. And then when they do like the biopic about my life, they'll be like, oh, these are these years when no one knew it. He was like, you know, clean up shit, but he's actually a genius. And it was, it, now that I'm almost 40, it's like, no, you're lucky to have this job, dude. Um, you know, even if it sucks, it's, you're lucky that you're employed and, and whatnot. And, you know, I it, it's it's funny. I now when I watch those films with this different kind of like you know I'm a lot more grateful. I just kind of empathize more. Like, oh man, I know I you know I know things are tough right now. I hope you kill those monsters and maybe you get a better job. But you know, it, it's just funny. As a kid, I kind of saw this as a it's like that that quote about how America thinks everyone in America thinks they're like a temporarily uh, inconvenienced millionaire. Like, and that's yeah. And I, I definitely kind of had that. I was temporarily, uh, temporarily inconvenienced, uh, artistic genius, which is, <laughs> I've learned is not exactly the case. Um, Most but, people uh, never, just never realize that it's not true. They, they <laughs> die thinking, ah, tomorrow's the day. Uh, probably, you know, man, it, it's, it's tough. Like, uh, but watching, watching those movies now and, and reading those books, it, it like, um, have you ever seen John Carpenter's They Live? Yeah, that's super blue cowl, man. All those oh. guys in flannels, hell yeah. <laughs> Fucking flannels, man. I love yeah. a good flannel. Dude, I, I I just bought one a few uh, weeks ago, and I'm really happy with it. It's yellow. I always wanted a yellow flannel. I got it. Yes. Um. Yeah. Thank you. Uh. It, that's actually where the Kickstarter money is going to go. It's going to go to getting me more yellow flannels. I never own a yellow flannel. What the hell? Dude, you should. I think I've seen you. You look good in it, man. Thank you. I'll go. I'll be on the lookout. I I love but, flannels. It's a bummer I live in Texas because most of the time it's too hot to have a flannel. But sometimes I put one on anyway, and I just I'm <laughs> stubborn about it. And I just go out well, with the heat. We, we have something in common. When I grew up in Arizona, dude, I was a little grunge kid, and it was so ridiculous because it's 110 degrees. But I'm like, I'll have this flannel. I'll wrap around my waist in case you know it gets a little chilly. And it's, it's never gonna get chilly, dude. I even wore like a fucking beanie. I have like a beanie and then I have a like shop goggles I stole from high school on top of my goggle, on top of my beanie because I thought it was Lane Staley. And I was just a sweaty fucking pimply kid just like just punishing himself for no reason. I would still be uh, have spilt in the beanie if my fucking fill head didn't break out immediately. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, one thing I wonder with my kid is like, it, it's funny now, it's basically like, when you're a teenager, you're going to have zits and I'm just going to like, Tell me it 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 will it will pass, but it does it's it's a bummer, man. I remember watching as a kid. Speaking of like blue collar stuff, Blade Runner, you know they're cops and whatnot. There's still like a very a working class sensibility to a lot of it. And Edward James almost the first time I saw his face, I was like, oh my god, is that gonna be me? Oh, that's and the way I feel really bad. Edward James almost, I actually think you're very handsome. You have pock marks, but you you wear them well. You're you're very dynamic and cool looking, but. Uh, as a kid, I, I I don't know having having zits and all that stuff. It's um oh she I have a good a good segue. Being a teenager, all these things matter to you much a, a lot, right? Like you you feel, but uh, the blue collar kind of like uh, horror sci fi stories, why they're kind of a little more compelling than like standard sl like slasher stuff of teenagers is that the stakes are. They're a little higher. Even as a kid, even as a teenager myself, I could tell that the Friday 13th kids, they had, they had shit all to worry about. They just wanted to get laid and maybe get high. And 
Yeah, and that's that's fun. That's totally fun to watch. But like you watching like uh, Terminator, the first one. Sarah Connor is a waitress, and her job is fucking rough, and she's all these things. And it's just like it's, it's a little it's a little more interesting, and and, and I feel like uh, they're almost more more realistic people. Yeah, I uh, agree with you completely. That's a great point. That's a great point to go out at. I think. <laughs> yeah, zits are bad, but you know, having a job's worse. And jobs suck. Life sucks. But on the other hand, you do have this comic book coming out. Why don't you tell us a little bit about the uh, the Kickstarter itself? What type of uh, bonuses could we be looking for? Thanks, man. Yeah. Um. So, I'm I'm doing a thing where basically, uh, for some of the early tiers, you get um digital copies of I have two different art books, which are full of different um pop culture characters and stuff like that done in my art style. And uh, you can also get digital copies of Serious Creatures, the new graphic novel, and also my um earlier graphic novel Lumen, which is a sci-fi fantasy uh, action adventure. And then for um 25 bucks, you actually get the the Serious Creatures, the actual graphic novel, which is um. 226 pages i think and so the book's gonna have all six issues of the comic series um a bunch of behind the scenes um concept art character studies um six different essays by different novelists filmmakers and artists talking about um uh special effects and and, and horror films and things that um kind of relate to the world i i, I um was discussing and exploring in the comic book and the one thing i'm really excited about is um, i'm doing a cartoonist commentary and so if you buy the comic book, the graphic novel of Serious Creatures, you get um, a download to a illustrated guide, which walks you through nearly every page of the comic book, which will explain all the references, um, some personal anecdotes, all the little Easter eggs, and basically all the choices I made while making the comic book. Um, it's the equivalent of a director's commentary, and that's, that's I'm putting it together right now, and it's really fun to kind of walk through and uh, see all the mistakes I made, and then and try to try to justify them. Um, but and so by the time that if you, if you want to put in a little more money than just the cost of the book, you're going to get um, uh, some original art from me. I, I I have a lot of art, and I'm also going to do commissions for the highest price stuff. Uh, where I'll draw characters that you uh, you ask me to draw, and I think my style, my art style, is pretty distinct and it's different. And so you'll get something with a lot of flavor. Uh, and that's a uh, that's kind of it. That's awesome. Thanks. Uh, for anyone interested, uh, a link will be in the show notes. So uh, click that. Go, uh, go support it. I, uh, I don't read a ton of comic books. I just, I don't know why. I just don't. But this is hands down like the best one I've ever read in my life. It is. Oh shit! Thanks, man. So much fucking fun. Oh, thank you, dude. Thank you. Really, that that, that means a lot. I, um, yeah, it, it's a lot of fun to make. You know, I, I um. I will say this: I, 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 I'm still growing as an artist. I think everyone is, but I, I feel like I'm still in the middle, middle of a, a big growth period. But I think this is the best thing I've done so far, and I feel at an all-time creative high right now, which is a really nice feeling. Fuck yeah! You, uh, you getting ready to, to begin season two? Yeah, season. Yeah, exactly. So, serious creatures. This story tells a complete story, but it is the first of two parts, and so the next part is going to be called uh, "Now Leaving the Golden State." And it's going to be kind of the downward trajectory of Bobby Feckle's uh, career in life. And this is kind of like the second half of Boogie Nights or Goodfellas where shit hits the fan. And so we're going to see like, the, the highest of the highs of Bobby and then the lowest of the lows. And especially, it's basically going to be the 80s through the 90s. So practical effects making way for CGI and Bobby's life kind of following that uh, downward slope. Fuck yeah. Boogie Nights is a great way to describe it. I was also thinking of that movie as I was reading the uh, the last issue of uh, season one. Is that what you call them, seasons? I don't know. Uh, well, I mean, I, I think it's a basically a good equivalent. I guess story arc or whatever, but it's all the same. They, 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 I, feel, I view it as a TV season. It's a, You know, there's a finale, but then you know they'll come, come back next year or next season or whatever. Yeah, see, I like seasons. Let's go with that. All right. Uh, how can folks find you online? Um, you can find, luckily, no one has my name. So if you look up Tony McMillan at uh, gmail.com, you can Gmail me. Uh, look up Facebook, you can Facebook me. And on Instagram, I post art almost every day, just new stuff I'm doodling. So look up Tony McMillan on Instagram, and you'll find me. And uh, what is the uh, Kickstarter uh, page called, just for those who uh, don't want to click on my show notes for some reason? Okay, if you're going to be difficult, I guess, uh, and not uh, you know, try to hurt Max's feelings, like it's basically... Uh, serious Creatures, a horror-adjacent coming-of-age comedy. Hell yeah. Go do it. Yeah. 
Hey, if you liked today's episode of Ghoulish, please go rate and review us on iTunes and all the other places you can do such a thing. I have a Patreon at patreon.com slash pmmpublishing, where I'm not podcasting, I'm writing books, and I'm also publishing books by other folks, such as Paul Michael Andelson, whose new novella, Standalone, is out right now. It's a science fiction slasher, and it's uh, going to blow your fucking mind. I also recently put out a journal a video by Michael David Wilson and upcoming in October it's Antioch by Jessica Lennell. Go get them at perpetualpublishing.com and always please feel God live spooky. Die spooky. <laughs> Spooky, die spooky! <laughs>